Welcome to the Victoria Anarchist Book Fair's week of podcasts and performances featuring local, national, and international activists and authors. The Book Fair Collective and From Embers have teamed up this year to release presentations over our podcast platform that can't be held in person due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Recordings of these voices of resistance were conducted on unceded Indigenous territories across so-called British Columbia and beyond. For more information about the book fair and a full schedule of online events this week, you can check out victoriaanarchistbookfair.ca. Listeners in the Victoria region are encouraged to visit Camus Books at camus.ca for anarchist publications and more. Thanks for listening. My name is Ven, she, her, or they, them pronouns, and I'm on the Victoria Anarchist Book Fair Collective. This interview, we're going to be talking about the work of the ECR, or Emergency Committee for Ojava, and their tireless efforts to support the self-governing, anti-patriarchal, anti-capitalist, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and anti-colonial autonomous region of Rojava. We'll be talking to Dr. Oslem Goner, she, her pronouns. Uh, she's a steering committee member of the ECR, Emergency Committee for Rojava, that is based in New York. She is also an associate professor of, at City University of New York, where she teaches in the departments of sociology and anthropology, and also teaches Middle Eastern studies. The Victoria Anarchist Book Fair Collective acknowledges the Lekwungen and Wasanich peoples, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations, and the Saanich Nation, whose occupied traditional territories we organize, live our lives, work, play, and hold our events upon. This interview was recorded not only on their territories, but also the traditional territories of the Hulunik Suwakan speaking Munse Lenape. As part of this acknowledgement, I personally would like to add that defending Rojava must by necessity be paired with defending indigenous land and water defenders around the world, including here at home. We must ensure that as settlers and colonizers, we are not ignoring indigenous movements at home trying to defend the land and cultures they belong to from the violences of colonization while we work to defend movements like Kurdish indigenous movements dreaming of the same. Enjoy the episode. So if you would like to introduce yourself and uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, sure. Hello, everyone. I am Uslam uh, Ghanar, Uslam Gunarj. I am part of uh, ECR, Steering Committee member of the Emergency Committee for Rojava that is based in New York, but also is a larger national list. I am also um, a, an associate professor at uh, City University of New York, where I teach in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and I also teach Middle Eastern Studies. Um, so today, I guess I would like to talk a little bit about ECR's work, um, the work that we're doing for the Rojava Revolution and in defense of Rojava Revolution here in New York City. And um, we'll also briefly talk about Rojava and the importance of this revolution, especially from the angle of the women's movement and women's freedom. And um, to understand that, I believe that we need to look a, in deeper, um, we need to develop a deeper look into the Kurdish women's freedom movement and talk about its development, its importance, you know, how come um, these handful um, of women in the middle of the Middle East um, were able to be pioneers of a revolution um, that's anti-state, anti-patriarchal, um, anti-capitalist at the same time. So we can talk about the history of that movement and the women's role in that, if you like. Awesome. Yeah, would love that. So if you want to start us off talking about uh, how you got involved with um, the Emergency Committee for Rojava and the work that they do? Um, sure. Um, well, the, you know, Rojava revolution um, that first became known um, with the attacks, the ISIS attacks in Kobani, starting in 2014, 2015. And along with that, um, ISIS attacks in the region of northeast Syria, um, there is a revolutionary movement that it simultaneously took place that uh, with the motto of self-defense um, against this um, oppressive force, but at the same time, um, they developed something much more, much larger than that. So starting in 2015, 2016, um, the movement, um, the, the region of the Middle East and especially northeast Syria witnessed this 
um, egalitarian, anti-capitalist, anti-state, um, and anti-patriarchal revolution that was very promising for the, and also it's a multi-ethnic, multi-religious, with its multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, emphasis that it was an example to the larger Middle East in terms of promises of hope. Um, so, but uh, um, expectedly, um, the Turkish state, um, which, you know, has a large Kurdish population, has historically oppressed its Kurdish population, um, started to attack this revolution under the motto, under the false um, um, discourse that it's pre presenting a threat to Turkey's internal borders, which Rojava and the revolution there has never made any attacks to Turkey or anything like that. But the, but the fear from the Turkish side was that um, it would um, become an inter-regional uh, and international force, and it would also impact the Kurdish populations within Turkey. So Turkey, um, as historically suppressed with its Kurdish minority populations since the formation of the Turkish state in the 1920s, um, started attacking Rojava revolution. And in 2018, um, it um, occupied, forced um, uh, Afrin, which was a, one of the largest cantons of the region, of the revolutionary forces, and it drove out, it invaded Afrin, the Turkish forces aligned, air forces aligned with ISIS and other jihadi militia. Uh, in 2018, they derived more than 180,000 Kurds from their homes, and they basically incorporated this Kurdish-majority region of northeast Syria um, into Turkey and have started their Islamization policies and have replaced the populations here with the jihadi militia that they have uh, done their attacks with. And additionally, at the same time, they have uh, specifically targeted um, the Yezidi and Christian holy sites, so the minorities in this region, along with the Kurds. They banned the Kurdish language in favor of Turkish, and they murdered and raped um, Kurds who remained there to defend their homes. The other Kurds escaped. So this is the exact context where I started working with the Emergency Committee Rojava, I was in New York City, United States, and I was, um, I'm Kurdish myself. I've been involved in um, Kurdish movements in the region. And, um, but in New York City, there was no protests and no acknowledgement of what was happening in, um, in, in Rojava. And this was, you know, for us Kurds, um, it was a very traumatic episode and enraging because we have experienced this violence in many forms and we have struggled to end it um, for as long as, you know, we have been alive. So for many of us, this is the case. But unfortunately, um, the, both the violence against the Kurdish populations that had started and dated back to the colonization of the Kurdish people in the early 20th century um, it did not have any uh, people in the U.S., you know. In Europe, there's a larger Kurdish population, and people are more aware of it. There are movements, diaspora movements. But in the U.S., there was um, uh, silence about it. People didn't know about it. Even people in the left who have, you know, taken on the Palestinian cause and have been... Um, uh, somewhat knowledgeable in the Israeli occupation of Palestine, did not have knowledge about the Kurdish situation, did not know about the colonization of the Kurdish people starting early in the early 20th century, and taking on many, many forms of violence and assimilation since then. Um, so it was, you know, um, it was depressing in a way to see that nobody talks about it, nobody writes about it, and to the extent that people talk about it, uh, it was to keep the U.S. out of there, which is, you know, this anti-imperialist position, which we cherish and agree with in many ways, but at the same time, these positions, these perspectives did not see um, the violence against these unprotected colonized populations 
And they were not only the victims, you know, Kurds have been victimized throughout the history, but there and then, at that point, which dates back, as we'll talk about, um, they have started a, a very um, important revolution that was anti-patriarchal, anti-state, multi-religious, multi-ethnic, anti-capital. So this was very important um, for the world to also understand and to defend, not just to defend the oppressed people of Kurds of the Middle East, but also to defend the revolution and the values of this revolution. So um, that was the context that I started uh, working with ECR, Emergency Committee for Rojava, which was one of the only maybe um, organizations then that was um, that uh, had the motive of defending Rojava revolution and its principles and spreading knowledge about Rojava and um, spreading knowledge about the principles of Rojava revolution um, to outreach and to create, um, you know, sympathy and defense for this cause in the U.S., um, so that was the context, and then the Turkish attacks have continued since then, since 2018. Uh, and most recently, in September 2019, Turkish President Erdogan spoke at the UN, United Nations rally, openly discussing its plans of ethnic cleansing in Rojava which then got followed by Trump's decision to withdraw the U.S. troops, which had until then provided a buffer against the Turkish attacks. And since then, Turkey's attacks, feminicide, occupation, continues without international condemnation. And sometimes, occasionally, there is, you know, some level of verbal condemn condemnation, but it doesn't translate into policy. So this is the context where ECR um, continues to work to defend Rojava revolution and also to see if those principles of the revolution um, can be practiced elsewhere and can be generalized elsewhere. Um, so we also do have outreach um, campaigns and coalitions. And most recently, for example, we have gotten... Uh, we have we formed uh, together with a number of different organizations a global um, coalition for prison abolition uh, in the U.S. and beyond. There are many organizations from Brazil and Middle East, um, Europe, and so we work to defend Rojava and to also um, to to you know use this example to develop meaningful forms of justice and freedom around the world. Yeah, that's excellent. And I, one thing that really did strike me as you were, as you were speaking was talking about the sort of the femicide that preceded American intervention and how that sort of resumed um, uh, now that America has, has pulled out. Um, what, what do you think are, are some of the things that have been happening since America's pulled out um, that people don't seem to be as aware of uh, now, like from, from when America pulled out to currently? Yeah, I mean, uh, people, first of all, people of Rojava have moved um, down from their homes, you know, away from the Turkish border, even though they had no, you know, and there has been thousands of people who have been displaced since um, Trump's decision to pull the troops, despite the fact that not all troops have been even pulled out. And the Turkey has attacked, um, and with the jihadi forces that it has brought to the area, so this is basically for people who might not know the context, it is the Turkish Air Forces, Turkish military, aligned with the many jihadi forces, including the ISIS um, uh, forces in the region that, you know, take different names. And so, and they have uh, undertaken, feminicide is a very important aspect of the violence that they use in the region, because these forces have especially been um, upset by Kurdish women taking pioneering role in defeating of the ISIS forces and in, Tur in Kurdish women taking pioneering roles in the revolution, in politics, 
and so they don't accept this and their first target is actually being very um, uh, you know, very sad to watch for a, for, for a Kurdish person who have been working for the rights of the Kurdish population for some time now, um, that they have attacked, for example, they killed Khavrin Khalef, which was the human rights advocate um, in the region, a woman. Um, and so they've been attacking especially notable women. And, you know, this is the, the genealogy uh, academy and elsewhere, they've been working explicitly on how state violence have been gendered and have been especially um, using forms of sexual violence, rape. In the Yazidi case, we've known, um, you know, the kidnapping of the Yazidi girls and women. And so they've been especially violent using these uh, gendered um, sexual violence against the Kurdish and minority women in the region. So that is what um, has, you know, taken attention of the uh, political rights, human rights activists in the region as well. And they have been using the, the term feminicide to stop the Turkish attacks. But unfortunately, you know, and also in the midst of coronavirus, you know, this is during this period, that mm -hmm. uh, Rojava has also experienced this and that Turkey has been explicitly attacking the water sources in the region, has been attacking the dams in the region and shutting the water. And so people have remained without water for days and weeks. And so it's uh, using whatever strategies it can, violence and gendered violence and um, very, you know, driving, depriving people of the very basic necessities of survival so that they uh, move elsewhere. And this is, you know, and Turkish President Erdogan, this is the uh, dramatic, uh, traumatic thing about the international scene. And that is why, you know, when Kurds ask for the help of the U.S., that is because there has been a failure of international forces, that international organizations to do anything to prevent it, the attacks against um, the Kurdish populations. And so, for example, in the 2019 UN uh, conference that I just mentioned, uh, Erdogan explicitly stated that his objective is to remove Kurdish populations from the area. He didn't use that, but he said he's going to place his Syrian sisters and brothers who have escaped the region, he's going to situate them back there, back basically in areas which are majority Kurdish. So this is, um, a, this is a population change that he's explicitly calling. It's actually considered to be a war crime, but he can talk this freely about this at the UN meeting, which is, you know, an exact concrete example of the failure of any international organization, any international measure of protection and defense um, for these people, for their right to survive, basically, even. Um, so it's been, you know, and that is why, if we, you know, I, we're, we're aware and we have had many exchanges with, you know, what does it mean for um, Rojava representatives to call for the help of the U.S.? Well, because there is no other resort, right? Because there's no international mechanism that could even provide um, a, a free zone, you know, free air zone, so that Turkey at least do not attack um, with its air force. And so when Trump um, uh, decided to take the U.S. troops out of the region, uh, the international forces and the U.S. and the coalition, uh, there's been a failure to even implement something as simple as um, a free air zone so that, uh, you know, this to prevent Turkish air attacks in the region at the very least. Um, so since 2000, and, I mean, since 2018, the occupation of Afrin and then the recent occupation following this UN convention and the U.S. troops withdrawal, um, has left the area defenseless and people doing their best. And there is, you know, very strong self-defense um, that's still in the region, that people, you know, are agents of history. They're making this history, but we know that the forces of history are against them. And so that is very important for all progressive forces um, to 
defend this re revolution and to prevent the rest of the Rojava to turn into Afrin, which has been um, known for it is, you know, thousands of cases of rape and sexual violence. And as I said, at the very least, um, uh, there's been more than 100,000 people who were displaced and were um, placed in place with um, the, the jihadi militia forces in the region. So it has turned into a complete um, and dark hole in the midst of, you know, where it was previously governed by the co-presidency system, women were ruling, education system was reviving itself to be multilingual, multi-religious. So it was a very promising place that turned into, with the Turkish occupation, into, um, you know, a complete... Um, sexist and um, yeah I mean it's just when I talk about it I just see these images of the transformation of Afrin even that one single region is exemplary of why we need to stop Turkey's attacks of Rojava. And um, you know sort of on that point um, you know I think it's worth talking about the the achievements um, and the things that are worth defending and these these um, examples of, of potential that was being realized and is, is still to some extent being realized even under, you know, as much attack as, as, um, as everything is. And specifically with um, the Kurdish women's movement, um, if you want to speak on, on, on that and on sort of uh, after all the, after all the dark stuff to talk about what, what is so great about this and what is, you know, something to uh, look to um, as uh, you know, really great examples of, you know, social organization and things like that. Sure, sure. I mean, that's, yes, for sure. And that is why, you know, um, I think uh, when we look at even the history of oppression or how, you know, colonized people like Kurds have been oppressed and victimized in many ways, at the same time, they do have their historical agency. And in the case of the Kurdish movement, Let's start with what Rojava is now, the pillars of its revolution, and then how it came there, how it achieved that maybe. So, I mean, the most important aspects of Rojava revolution, I would say it's based on uh, feminist, ecological, and democratic confederalist pillars to practice radical democracy instead of top-down democratic models of election, that it has put out the system of democratic confederalism, which is bottom-up organization of society and bottom-up decision-making from the very basic level of a small village um, to the larger districts and to larger towns and then to the largest system of the Rojava that's based on the three cantons. So then it provides this self-governing bottom-up form of democracy um, that's also uh, based on the representation of uh, women. Uh, there's a 40% quota in every organization that women need to um, be at least 40% of the, any governance, any organization. And then there's also the co-presidency system so that women and men, um, you know, uh, co-preside any type of organization and to prevent any... Um, um, masculinist takeover of these spaces that were, you know, during the Assad regime were obviously all men in implemented, patriarchally implemented uh, politics and decision-making processes. So, um, and another thing that's also, you know, we're going to go back in history now to talk especially from the women's revolution and women's freedom movement angle to talk about how women got to establish their own organizations. But one thing that's uh, very different about Rojava Revolution is that women have been able to establish their own parallel structures, parallel organizations, uh, spaces that are uh, dedicated for women where they can make their own decisions and that their decisions have a binding influence impact on the all gender organizations. So women have... Uh, established organizationally uh, uh, strength and level of power that hasn't been exercised elsewhere, um, I would say. And ecological, because it is against the capitalist modernist idea of putting human at the center 
of our world practices, of our politics and economics. So instead, it is um, based on a commune-based, ecological reorganization, restructuring of society, where humans, just like any other living being in nature, live peacefully and produce peacefully. And this is especially important, the ecological aspect, because, you know, what was before the Rojava revolution was Rojava was colonized under the Assad regime in Syria. Syria has colonized Rojava region for a very long time. And they have, for example, um, uh, imposed a monocropping of wheat into this, which happens in a lot of colonized spaces that, um, that they are used to monocrop as opposed to diverse cropping practices that are more ecologically friendly. So the first thing they've changed, they've been trying to change is this diversity in cropping and more ecologically uh, friendly um, agricultural styles. Now, of course, there is, you know, these are what they are at least um, trying to accomplish. And this comes out of a longer term critique of a capitalist modernity project um, that was based on patriarchy, capitalism, and state, nation-state structure. So it's critical of all these practices, all these systems of oppression that have worked hand in hand in the region, um, starting with the late 19th, early 20th century at the very least. Some of these systems of oppression date back, obviously, um, but. Um, so to replace these with feminist, ecological, and democratic capitalist pillars that is based on um, religious and lingual diversity and ethnic diversity. And this is, you know, for example, I think another, um, another important thing that has been implemented by the colonial forces in the Middle East is that they have pitted populations from different ethnic and religious orientations onto each other. Not that these populations, these ethnicities and religions um, were in fight with each other. They were not. They were pitted against each other by the systems, by the nation states, uh, systems of uh, oppression that, you know, for example, I mean, there's many tactics of this. I personally um, study a lot in the, you know, areas of state uh, mo mobilization of particular populations to pit them against each other. So, and it has happened a lot in the Middle East, you know. So this practice was promising also because it had shown us how Arabs, Kurds, these Christians... Um, work together and not just with this false, you know, uh, premise of diversity, but they're actually um, producing together, learning together, learning from each other's experiences. Obviously, there are contradictions as this happens. If we talk about history and centuries long um, uh, populations having been pitted against each other to fight against each other. So there's still some contradictions, but that they are um, willing to solve the and to work together. And one good example of this has been how uh, pedagogy in Rojava, for example, education system in Rojava has been multilingual, right? As opposed to Assad regime's Arabization policies in the region, uh, opposite to Turkey's Turkification projects in the region for a very long time. Um, you know, that there has been an, a very explicit effort um, to uh, have these populations live and produce and create collectively together. And so this is another, you know, um, promising aspects of the Rojava Revolution. And, um, you know, if you have questions here, I'm happy to answer. But one of the major questions that I have been trying to explore is especially in the case of uh, feminism and women's organizations and parallel structures, how come this happened to be the case? But that goes hand in hand with these other principles of ecology, of democratic confederalism, of diversity principles that, you know, have um, coexisted and have been exercised, practiced um, in Rojava, in Northeast Syria, 
um, that has been, you know, triggered and opened up and founded by Kurds originally, but then many different um, ethnic and religious populations have been working together collectively side by side and have been uh, experimenting with democratization themselves with the um, so it has started as a Kurdish project, but nowadays it's actually beyond that to the extent that it's practiced by the various religious ethnic groups in the region collectively. So I, you know, if you have any questions about the pillars of Rojava, um, if not, I'd also like to talk about how this happened to be the case and why and how women um, have started to become pioneers. Yeah, well, actually, that's exactly um, what I was going to ask you about was specifically about that. So, yeah, um, go on. Um, sure. Um, so, I mean, you know, this is um, YPG, YPG forces that are um, the self-defense forces in um, Syria. They're different from the PKK, which is the Kurdish um, Workers' Party in that was founded in Turkey, but also with organic connections to Syria. So even though they're different organizations, ideologically and organically, they have worked um, together for some time now. And I think this history, you know, when, for example, in the U.S. media, people have put these pictures of women guerrilla with their rifles um, fighting against ISIS and seeing women, if you look deeper, you know, some people fail to look deeper, but if you look deeper, I mean, to, to, actually, even that's interesting. Like women having, you know, um, fought against one of the most uh, violent forces that was um, quite a sexist force of history, and they've self-defended themselves. And even that's interesting, but there was much beyond that, that if you look dig deeper, you would see that women are heads of political organizations, they are um, in higher positions in military and in governance, in the democratic confederalist model of governance. And if you look deeper, you could see um, the co-presidency system where women have equal, if not more, say, ideally, that the idea is to continuously um, have women's parallel organizations where uh, where these organizations also have a binding impact on the all gender units. So there's a, in idea, but also in practice, we have seen examples of it being practiced even at the level of military commanding, which is, you know, known to be one of the most masculinist areas of society. So it's been implemented quite well. Um, but so how did they get there? So all of a sudden, right, the U.S. media that was interested in ISIS and later Trump's decision um, were giving these pictures, were putting, yeah, I think it was even in the cover of Times magazine. So we had all of a sudden Kurdish freedom fighters. Um, obviously, I mean, there's these images could be criticized, especially to the extent that they haven't looked at what these women stood for at all. So they haven't looked at the principles of the revolution, but it was interesting still to see how they get there. And so I think the history of it is actually hidden um, earlier on in the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party that got originated in Turkey, but also got um, opened up in its military and in terms of education and practices that's um, in Northeast Syria and also in Iraq, Northern Iraq. So they had organic ties with these revolutionary organizations and have gone pedagogic educations together. Um, so the PKK was uh, formed in the late 1970s, um, along with a number of, at the time, you know, in the 1960s and 70s, Turkey, had witnessed an upsurge of the leftist movements, Marxist-Leninist movements, um, and PKK was another one of these, but with a special emphasis on the colonization of the Kurds. So the problem was that the other leftist Marxist-Leninist organizations, most of them, with the exception of one, I would say, has not paid attention 
to the colonization of Kurds and the Kurdish problem and where it, you know, where it stands in understanding uh, different forms of oppression in the region. So the PKK started with those, but talked also specifically about the colonization of the Kurds. And at the time, it was a Marxist-Leninist organization, which also had inspiration for the Kurdish self-determination. And within that, even from its founding, that there has been very important women um, in the initial founding of the PKK. And one of the figures of this was Sakina Jansus, who was from the region of Dersim, which is an Alibi Kurdish town. Alibi is a religious minority, um, Kurdish ethnic minority, and she was a woman. And so she had a, put them together this like triple oppression, this um, in its position to analyze the multiple forms of oppression that were um, oppressing her own society. And also where she's from, she's from Dersim once again, that's uh, one of the largest uh, massacres, um, genocidal project has taken place in that particular town. And in her memoir, for example, she talks about the impact of that um, genocide, Darsim genocide that happened in 1938 on her childhood memories. So we see, uh, especially in her, but later it grows because in the late uh, 1970s, PKK became formed. But then in 1980, the Turkish state undertakes a coup d'etat in the region and penalizes all students' organizations, Marxist-Leninist organizations, and attacks the PKK. But PKK, the largest cadre, including Abdullah Öcalan, the founder, and today, you know, considered still to be the leader of the movement and has also been considered the leader of the Rojava revolution to the extent that, you know, his pictures, his sayings um, really shaped the discourse of the Rojava revolution. And so he was able to escape to the larger Middle East to organize the movement there. But the women, especially Sakine Jansuz and Gülten Kushanak, who is now also in prison, Sakine Jansuz was murdered in Paris, in the middle of Paris. And so all these figures, you know, have been under extreme threats, um, extreme threats of violence. But Jansuz was imprisoned in the infamous Diyarbakir prisons um, in the 1980 with the 1980 coup d'etat, which I believe that it is the starter of the Kurdish women's movement and the Kurdish women's freedom movement. Because in that prison, um, they have resisted against the dehumanization of political prisoners. And there was extreme use of sexual violence, of tortures of different forms against these women's prisoners. And they have resisted against this. And for example, um, and their resistance has been very important for the formulation of the PKK and for the survival of the PKK. Um, and because, you know, it's been talked about in the party politics, in meetings, and when uh, Öcalan, for example, after Sakine Jansuz was released, after her term in prison, and Öcalan meets her for the first time, Öcalan does talk about how the resistance has been exemplary and has shown what women can accomplish. So from then on, I would say 1980s, the resistance in um, especially the women's uh, prisons in the Arbukur against sexual violence, Turkish state sexual violence against the Kurdish women. Because this is very important. It is state violence against Kurds, but it is gendered state violence, particularly against the Kurdish women, to dehumanize them, to put shame on them that they've resisted. And in so doing, they were resisting both state and patriarchy simultaneously. So that is why that particular resistance in the women's prisons in the Arbukur in early 1980s had been very influential um, in the growth of the movement, the Kurdish women's movement. And then Abdullah Öcalan, the leader of the movement, even though he was a man, he uh, increasingly 
uh, takes interest in the women's cause and um, writes specifically about the colonization of Kurdish women, not just Kurdish populations, but the specific um, role that the state was using, specific types of violence that the state and also later the Kurdish society that have used against the Kurdish women. So kind of uh, recognizing the double oppression of the Kurdish women by the state and by patriarchy simultaneously and has put women into a position of being the agent of change in society. And Öcalan has written about this in the 1990s, or late 1980s, early 1990s. And one of the foundational moments of this movement was actually in 1995. So, you know, there's actually a di divide in terms of ideology, discourse versus practice in some movements. So I would say one of the important uh, foundational differences of the PKK and its feminist um, approach has been that as they were discussing alternative solutions, they always looked for ways to implement those decisions in their organization. For example, following these talks, these discussions, these writings where they talked about the double oppression of the Kurdish women, in 1995, PKK declared a resolution concerning the women's army and free women's movement. So this 1995, so that's a very long time ago, you know. And they wrote the potential of women who make up half of the society in the service of the revolution and their hidden and suppressed talents and intelligence in creating an entire society based on equality is the most humane and the most radical characteristic of our revolution. So I think it's um, good to recognize then that this women's freedom and free organizations that we see today date back to 1980s, early 1990s, because this resolution in 95 granted independence to women's organizations and also opens the way to all women units to have relative power over all gender units. So, you know, in many revolutions, women have taken arms to fight. And during the fights that they've given some power, they were needed. Um, in some instances, they weren't even given that power. They were, you know, used as cooks and basically um, sent back to the kitchen and they became the women of the revolution in their gender roles. In some, it was a step ahead and they have given women arms to fight alongside men. So that was a positive development. But even then, at the end of the revolution, women were usually sent back to where they belong. In, you know, for example, in the Sandinista revolution. So what is different here is that they have formulated organizations, structural um, uh, They made structural changes into their organization um, to have the, the continuity of women's struggle and the continued fight against women's oppression, uh, an important factor of their revolution in the you know Kurdish freedom movement. So, and this is um, basically uh, what we see in Rojava and in Turkey, for example, that this first started in the PKK, all women guerrilla units all women uh, houses of uh, resolution, conflict resolution, you know, so these are the organizations I'm talking about that women take power in their hands and make decisions on behalf of women, on behalf of themselves. Later got represented also in the more legal politics, for example, the Kurdish political party in Turkey have implemented the co-presidency system uh, and have uh, implemented the 40% quota. Um, and so these are, you know, and women have become uh, visible, not just to fight against, you know, the state oppression of Kurds, 
but also to fight against patriarchy alongside it. Now, patriarchy both against the Turkish state, but also against their own societies, communities, and it's ongoing. You know, this is an ongoing process. Um, but at the same time, as Kurdish women became um, actors of history making, actors of freedom movement, that they have been uh, explicitly attacked by the um, Turkish uh, state and by the state elsewhere, you know, because Kurds have been colonized under four different nation states and they have been specifically targeted. And, you know, in addition to what's happening in Northeast Syria, in Turkey today, for example, Kushanak, whom I mentioned here as one of the founders of the Kurdish women's movement, is in prison and sentenced to more than 14 years. And Sakine Jansis once again was assassinated in the middle of Paris. And many others, like Sabah Tunjel, Figen Yüksekta, are in prison. Um, that are, you know, more than 10, 14 years. And so these are both women's resistance, women's struggle to develop um, uh, women's freedom against the capitalist, modernist, uh, patriarchal state projects um, have been then reached, have reached the height also in Rojava and have been implemented, women's revolution have, is, is being implemented in many different forms, from bottom-up democratic models to all women units, to the all women YPG um, units. And so now, we, you know, at least um, we can understand, I hope, and there's a longer history to that, but that at least it started um, you know, late 1970s, early 80s, and women fought hard to make these gains and they have not, um, and they have always been aware of the intersectionality of multiple forms of oppression, intersectionality of identity, and to understand not just, you know, demand rights for women, but to demand the change of society, a radical change in society is necessary for the emancipation of the larger the society from forms of oppression. So they've been agents of um, change and struggle against these multiple forms of oppression that have worked in tandem together uh, as they were oppressing the Kurdish women and beyond. And you spoke about um, uh, sort of the, the fact that they're not just fighting against um, the patriarchy of, say, the Turkish state or the Syrian state, um, but also within their own communities. And you also spoke about um, conflict resolution, like women, women's conflict resolution uh, organizations. Um, do you have any, you know, good examples of like a successful implementation of that kind of um, that kind of conflict resolution, especially as it pertains to issues between women and men uh, within the communities? Yes, yes, for sure. I mean, so women have been, for example, women's houses that are called Malajin have been uh, places composed of all women that are resolving conflict against around domestic violence and issues of divorce, issues of, you know, concerning family and family law. And they have been practicing it themselves. So, and this is, you know, one of the important examples that, you know, the society, uh, the revolution has its principles, but society has its realistic dynamics. So it has influenced and changed. The revolution has influenced and changed the society, but there are still gendered practices in the region. There is still domestic violence in some households. So this um, has been important. Women, all women units, all women houses called Mama Jin, had been um, doing the conflict resolution in many of these cases, you know, as opposed to the traditional law, traditional family laws, which were not protecting women, that they have been putting women's interests and needs ahead of everything else in these uh, forms of conflict resolution. Um, there's also, you know, um, issues, for example, in the U.S., you know, there's been the rise in uh, Me Too movement, so there's been women specifically in these also conflict resolution places, um, addressing issues of sexual harassment, 
And now in Rojava and beyond, once again, for example, in the Kurdish political party in Turkey, that women are solely responsible to investigate into um, uh, any claims against any HDP, the Kurdish party parliamentarians, cases of sexual harassment that they're um, first, you know, taken out of the party and women, all women units do the investigation and, uh, and their decisions are binding. So that's the most important thing, that their decisions have been binding over and over again um, on the uh, all gender units. So all gender units have to recognize the women, all women units um, uh, decisions around issues that concern women. Um, so these are some examples. And also, I mean, also another thing that's important is that women have been, you know, self-defense units of YPG that are international and fighting against outsider forces like ISIS is what we have witnessed. But there is also women's self-defense in the form of Asayish, which is, you know, especially today, it's important because um, in the U.S., you know, we witnessed, we participated at um, Black Lives Matter type movements and more radical branches of that that have asked for the abolition of police. Um, so in Rojava, for example, I think, uh, you know, there's the Asaish forces that are, again, um, uh, women and men, and also all women units within Asaish, or women units called Yepeje, in matters of self-defense and security. And this is very important because militarization and securitization have been the major pillars of uh, the working function of, of patriarchy was based on this monopolization of violence that excluded women from these spheres, where women are now in Rojava have taken arms against not only, you know, any threats um, to the society, but the idea of self-defense is broadened to include issues of defending oneself against forms of patriarchy that can come in different ways, in different, um, you know, um, ways than just specific explicit physical violence. So they have given that form of force and power um, to self-defend and to, to think of also self-defense in more broader terms than just against the particular um, physical threat. So, and I think another very important thing is in pedagogy and education, the development of genealogy, which is the science of women, um, in the universities, in colleges, and women's training programs where they have, you know, been um, going for education in matters of um, uh, feminism, in matters of world feminism, Rojava feminism, Rojava women's movements. So there's been explicit education of women, and this, these women come from all sorts of backgrounds. You know, some of them are university students, some of them are housewives, um, there's been, you know, um, reports and of this while women say, you know, this is the first time I can leave my home for 30 days to go for this training, this education. And because the revolution um, makes it possible and women push the boundaries of their families to go and join these programs, um, it has been uh, also the women's education programs under the name of Genealogy Academy in universities and at other institutes that are for like 20, 30 day training of women on issues of gender um, have been, you know, very important um, in the um, survival of this revolution and it continuing to be a feminist revolution despite the odds. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I guess just to, to wrap up, if you had any sort of closing words, but I think sort of most importantly, um, what what people can do to help, how they can help the Emergency Committee for Rojava, um, the, you know, anything that is actionable is always sort of best to get out there in the world because that lets people know sort of what they can do themselves to to help out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that is great. So I would urge people to check defendrojava.org, which is our website. We also have a Facebook page, Emergency Committee for Rojava, if you search for that. And there we always have, you know, petitions, ongoing petitions, 
Uh, we have opened our chapter meetings now that everything is happening online uh, to a national base. So we are constantly writing brochures, writing letters, reaching out to, you know, parliamentarians, reaching out to po uh, political party representatives. So we have ongoing tasks. And we're also trying to connect to other organizations to see what we can accomplish together. So if you're an organization and want to be in touch um, um, and see, explore what we could do together. But we also have ongoing work for individuals who want to volunteer. Who want to, we have a continuing reading groups every month. We do read and continue to learn about um, Rojava Revolution, Kurdish Women's Movement. Sometimes we bring a more comparative approach. Um, so we have ongoing um, debates, discussions, and work um, to help the cause. So if you can, please, you know, check defendrojava.org website or search for Emergency Committee for Rojava um, and be in touch with us, contact us through there. Um, we'll definitely, we definitely have ongoing projects and tests that you can participate at. Awesome, and thank you so much for speaking on this. It's really important to get it to get it out there, and especially for you know sort of the the recent updates that you provided, especially as it re uh, 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 as it regards COVID nineteen and uh, the attacking of water and things like that, and how crucial that is to have clean water uh, at this time. And I, I think just being able to to go into both the history and what's going on right now. Um, that's really important. So yeah, thank you very much for, for speaking on this. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being interested in Rojava Revolution and in defending it. Ransom notes. Anarchist and anti-authoritarian music podcast. That's going to come out every month. Ransom what? Ransom notes. So what's like, I mean, what's your like ultimate goal, I guess, in, in this yeah. We are for the Rising up against the oppressor. The attitude that you see in hip hop. Let me uh, give you a sample of some of the uh, lyrics that had some of the older ladies among the stockholders quite with dismay. Go to ransom notes. I.libsin.com. Or get them from the Channel Zero Network.